Let's turn to the book of Luke chapter 13 with me this morning, please. Don't forget now the 29th of this month, starting on Sunday night, Sunday evening, 6 o'clock, started, we'll start a, uh, a uh, revival meeting that goes all the way through the following Wednesday. So this will be Sunday evening, 6 o'clock, the 29th of this month, last Sunday. Brother C.T. Townsend is going to be with us, going to be doing the preaching. So Luke chapter 13 and verse number 1. Luke chapter number 13 and verse number 1. There, now, there were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans, because they suffered such things? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or those eighteen upon whom the tower in Siloam fell, and slew them, Think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Lord, anoint your word now as it goes forth for the purpose that you intend it, and it will, not, it will accomplish that which you please, and will not return unto you void. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. The Lord Jesus Christ preached about repentance. Time and time and time again, he called it to the attention of the people that it was absolutely necessary for them to repent. And if you notice over here, the context of what you just read in Luke chapter 13 is the idea that when something happens to someone so terrible as the Galileans, what they'd suffered, and the and the tower at Siloam when it fell on these people, that people have a tendency to say, well, you know, this is just simply life, and this is the way things happen. And it's just part of life, and so tragedies are going to come. And, uh, and so therefore, uh, you know, we just, uh, we just understand it in that sense. Fatalism, in other words, that's the idea here. But the Lord Jesus Christ said, take note, take note, that the people who perished in these, in these uh, catastrophes uh, were really no different from you and me and anyone else, that we all must be prepared to face God Almighty. And in order to be prepared to face Him, we must deal with the issue of repentance. So I'm going to preach on that this morning. Repentance. I realize it is verboten today that you seldom ever hear anything about the word repentance. It's, not, it's not polit certainly not politically correct, believe me. But it's not preached that much in the church houses either. Repentance, therefore, is a, is a, when you see something like this, you have to say to yourself, you have to ask yourself this question. Now, since they don't want that preached today, then why? What's the issue involved here? What's going on? Why is it that they do, they do not want that preached? Now, there is uh, two separate camps in evangelicalism. One is the easy believism crowd, and then there are those who preach lordship salvation. Easy believism teaches and preaches that all you have to do is say the sinner's prayer, and since you said that, everything's going to be okay with you. Churches are full of people like that. They've prayed the sinner's prayer, uh, just like, uh, like Saul, the king of Israel, who said, I have sinned. But it didn't change him. He prayed the sinner's prayer. I have sinned. Didn't, say, didn't change him. Easy believism, folks, in my estimation, is an abomination to God. Amen. Really. Because you're giving people a false hope that everything is okay between them and God. Then you have lordship salvation, which I believe is a reaction to easy believism. I believe lordship salvation grew out of a abhorrence for easy believism. And in most of the cases, it teaches that uh, unless you're not, unless you're willing, unless you're willing to make the Lord Jesus Christ Lord of your life, uh, then, uh, then you can't be saved. And so therefore, they're trying to lay a foundation by saying 
that you have to understand that if you ask the Lord Jesus to save you, that He's going to have to be, He's going to be, He's going to become your Lord, and all the commandments of God and everything that goes with that is, is going to be necessary, or if you're not willing to do that, it doesn't matter how much you pray that you're not going to be saved. Now, I hope I haven't misrepresented them, but I believe that in a nutshell, that is lordship salvation. They're both wrong. Easy believism and lordship salvation are both wrong. And you say, well, now how do you know that, preacher? Well, when I get done preaching this message this morning, I hope that I'm able to reach into your heart and show you how that both probably are well-meaning people on both sides, but it's wrong. Repentance is not the root of salvation. Repentance is the fruit of salvation. Now, you need to understand that. It's very important. You're not saved because you repent. You're saved because you believe on the Son of God. But the one that caused you to believe on the Son of God is the Holy Ghost. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. It is a work of grace for you to call upon God to save you to begin with. Grace cannot be removed from the equation. It is the drawing power of God. Speaking to the heart of a sinner and bringing grace into that sinner's heart. Grace in the sense that he draws that sinner to Christ. And then that drawing to Christ, a lot of things can happen. Listen to what David Berkowitz said. Do you know who he is? He's the son of Sam. He's a notorious murderer. He took a 44 special. Back in those days, they called it a bulldog, charter arms. A 44 special is a big round, bigger than a 38. He would walk up to people and he would shoot them with that 44 special. He got life in prison for being a murderer. But someone witnessed to the son of Sam, David Berkowitz, and they witnessed to him over and over and over again. They wanted to get through this shell that was on the outside of this man. They wanted to reach into his heart, into what makes him tick. And it took a while, but one night, he said, I was reading Psalm 34, Berkowitz says. He says, I came upon the sixth verse which says, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. It was at this moment in 1987 that I began to pour out my heart to God. Everything seemed to hit me at once. The guilt of what I had done. The disgust at what I had become. Late that night in my cold cell, I got down on my knees <coughs> and began to cry to Jesus Christ. I told him that I was sick and tired of doing evil. I asked Jesus to forgive me of all my sins. I spent a good while on my knees praying to God. And when I got up, it felt as if a heavy but invisible chain had been around me for so many years was broken. A peace flooded over me. I did not understand what was happening in my heart. I just knew that somehow my life was going to be different. Now this is the testimony of a murderer. A cold-blooded murderer who says by his own testimony, he said, I was in the occult. I was a Satan worshiper. Hated God. But by the grace of God, his word began to move in the heart of David Berkowitz. And God drew him to himself. Now there are those out there that are going to say, well, yeah, well, he needed it. I don't. This is a murderer. I don't want a murderer preaching to me. I don't want a killer like that trying to tell me anything about God. I'm sure you feel that way. If you are one of the self-righteous hypocrites that come to church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, you see yourself as so much better than David Berkowitz ever was. But understand something today. David Berkowitz will be in glory walking on streets of gold one day and your self-righteousness will put you in hell. Oh, now you can't talk to me like that, preacher. I'm telling you that unless you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. I'm telling you that God is no respecter of persons. 
Faye, Carla Faye Tucker, is another murderer. And she took a pickaxe, folks. A pickaxe is an axe that has a, has a wide on one end, and then it's got a sharp end on the other end. And she took a pickaxe and buried it in the chest of two people. She buried it in the chest of one of them, right through the heart, and left them pinned to the floor. She did this when she was high on heroin and cocaine and whatever other drug she was in. She was a junkie. She was a drug addict. And she was completely lost without God, as lost as you could possibly be. And she got the death penalty. And they put her in prison in Texas. And while she was in prison in Texas, somebody went to her and began to tell her about the Lord Jesus and how He loved her. I don't know how long it took, but it got through her shell. It got to her heart. And do you know what Carla Faye Tucker said? Really got her and got her saved. It was the love of God. It was the fact that God could love somebody as sorry and low down as she was that God could love them. Now David Berkowitz got on his knees and cried out to God because he was a sorry, low-down murderer. And this Carla Faye Tucker, it was the love of God that got her. It doesn't matter what it is. It all leads to the same Lord Jesus Christ. That's the key to understanding salvation. It's not God coming to you saying, now you're going to have to live like that. You're going to have to do this. You're going to have to do this. You're going to have to do that. If you're not willing to do that, I'm not going to save you. No! A thousand times. It is the Holy Ghost saying to you, you're lost. That's your Savior. Jesus is the only way. Receive Him and you can be born again. And all of these things that men try to heap upon your soul are created created by men to hinder the work of the Holy Ghost of God. These two are saved. Carla Faye Tucker walked to her death chamber. She went in there with a smile on her face. There's a picture in all top. There's a picture of her body on the internet where she's lying with her arms outstretched when they gave her the lethal injection. And you can see a smile on her face. Glory to God! How many of you when it comes time to leave this world, we'll have a smile on your face. Or will you be clawing and screaming and scratching and scared to death and begging because you're about to leave this world? Folks, you don't know before that sun goes down tonight whether you'll be alive or dead. Amen. We have a sister in our church whose daughter's a nurse out there in Oak Ridge. And my friend, she works in a Methodist hospital. And out there just a few days ago, she watched a man die. Now, she'd seen a lot of people die. Nurses do. That happens all the time. And but this man, when he died, there was something different about it. Something vastly different about it. He began to scream that he was burning. And they stood around his bed and tried to do something to help him. But they couldn't put out the flames because the flames that were burning him were not physical flames lighted by a fire on this earth. It was the eternal fire of Almighty God that was taking that man's spirit and soul from his body and he died screaming, I'm burning, I'm burning, I'm burning. You don't want to die like that. Are you listening to this preacher? You don't want to die like that. And they shook them up. No doubt it shook. I'll guarantee you this. Till their dying day, they will never forget that encounter that they had in that room with a man who died burning in hell. Now most of the people at Temple have already heard that, but many of you have not. And you folks watching by the internet right now, you probably haven't. And you folks that will watch this later, you probably haven't. But be it understood, that happened right here in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, just a few weeks ago. Ago, a man died screaming that he was burning in hell. You don't want to die like that. How can I stay out of hell, preacher? There's one name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. Hallelujah to God. It's the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only one that can keep you out of hell. Repentance is not the root of salvation. It is the fruit of salvation. Now listen carefully. It is God's way of letting you know that you have not been deceived. We live in a very, very whitewashed, uh, very superficial, skin-deep 
generation. Everybody is offended today with nothing. Amen. You can't say anybody. Everybody carries their feelings on their shoulder. Boy, if you live the rest of your life like that, you're going to be one miserable soul. Folks, you can say whatever you please about me, and most of it will be true probably. But my Lord Jesus Christ is all that matters. Amen. If I carried my feelings on my shoulder, I wouldn't be here this morning. I have been called everything under the sun. But I want to tell you one thing. Praise God. I know whom I have believed. I am persuaded. He's able to keep that which I've committed to Him against that day. So it's God's way. Listen carefully. Repentance in your life is God's way of letting you know that you have saving faith and not just a bunch of stuff you believe up here. Somebody says some mumbo jumbo over you or gets you wet in some pool somewhere or confirms you or you pray the sinner's prayer and everybody assures you that you're a Christian but deep down inside your soul you know you're just as dead as you've always been. Nothing has changed. But if repentance begins to blossom, and this is, this is important, you're going to do far more repenting after you get saved than that day when you're praying to God to save you. For once the Holy Ghost moves into your soul, you're really going to see what you're made out of. If God had to do all of that before He could save you, it would take Him a week to save you. <laughs> you'd start repenting this morning and you'd be repenting a month from now. With all the stuff you've done in all your lifetime, and you get and you and you confess one thing, then another one comes on, and another one comes on, and there are those people out there that are so confused that people have them so messed up that they think, "Well, I wonder, did I confess this? Did I repent of this sin? Maybe I forgot to repent of that." Well, I know I'm not saved because I didn't repent of this. Holy Ghost just brought and see how confused you can get. The Bible said, "He that hath the Son." hath life, and he that hath not the Son hath not life. Have you ever noticed how that the singing has changed in the church house? Have you noticed that the songs that we sing here, they talk about you being a sinner and Christ is the Savior. They talk about death and they talk about hell. They sing about heaven. They sing about the blood that can wash your sins away. The book that we use here sings about life. It talks about the real person you are. But the churches today are full of praise and worship. Have you ever noticed that? You ever wonder why? Have you ever wondered why they don't want you to sing about sin and a Savior? They don't want you to sing about hell and they don't want you to sing about judgment? I'll tell you why. Because they've taken a bunch of easy believism, brainwashed people and they've taken them into their church house and said to them, we're going to make you feel good and we're going to have you pumped up by the time you walk out of here. You're just going to say, Lord, I'm so glad you got me. You really got something. I mean, God, you're really, you're a lot better off now that I belong to you and you're going to feel so good about yourself that your music is just going to pump you up and build up your flesh and they have to do that because you've got nothing on the inside. Once you're born again by the grace of God, you'll take that book and you'll sing those songs and those words written 150 or 250 years ago and you'll say, my goodness gracious, I see it the same way. Amen! Nothing's changed. We're the same today we were then. And that, my friend, is the witness of the Holy Spirit. So, oh yeah, you can make people feel good with praise and worship. But there's a vast difference between praise and worship and true worship of God. You see, only a born-again believer can worship God. Amen. Did you know that Pharaoh in the Old Testament is a good picture of the people who come to the church houses today? What do you mean, preacher? Well, Pharaoh, you know, when God brought judgment down upon them and the lice and the, and the Urim and the darkness and the hail and all the rest of it, Pharaoh would have a change of heart and see it. he'd say, oh, well, I repent. I, I mean, I, I don't want to go through another day like this. And Pharaoh's repentance was only skin deep because Pharaoh only wanted to get rid of the problems that had come into his life. And if the truth be told, many of you have been like that your whole life. The only time you ever seek the face of God is when you've lost your job or you get sick or your family's breaking up or your kids are bad or dopes come into your home or something's happened and then you come running to God. But dear friend, as soon as you get relief, it's out the 
door again and you don't have time for Him. Let me tell you today, you don't know God. You've been deceived. We're with Him in the good times and the bad times. He's with us when it's light and when it's dark. He's with us when the sun shines and when it's raining. He's God whether I understand Him or don't understand Him. He's the Lord. And beside Him there is none other. I come to church when I eat well. I come to church when I don't eat well. I come to church when it's going good. And I come to church when it's not going good. Why, preacher? Because I want to be here. That's why. I want to talk to Him. I want to praise Him. I want to love Him. I want to glorify Him. I want to exalt Him and lift up His holy name. Not because of what He's done for me, but because of who He is. And the Holy Ghost keeps reminding me, you haven't seen half of it yet. Eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man the things the Lord has in store for those that love Him. We see through a glass darkly, but then faith Face to face. Heaven's going to be beautiful. Heaven's going to be wonderful. We're going to walk down streets of pure, transparent gold. There's going to be that great reunion day when our mothers and our fathers and our sisters and our brothers and our husbands and our wives come running to meet us in that land of glory and light. What a hallelujah day that'll be. Well, my dear friend, that's just the beginning. That's just coming through the door. We'll see Him as He is. And a thousand million years from now, I'll still be singing amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Then that redeemed, 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 how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Sing, folks. We're going to sing. We're going to do some singing. Said all. It started with singing with His creation. It'll end with singing with His creation. Amen. But Zacchaeus over there in Jericho, the cursed city. You ever heard of Jericho? Cursed be the man that rebuilds Jericho. He'll lay the foundation in his firstborn. That's what it says. But Jericho is where the Lord Jesus went. He met Bartimaeus down there. You remember Bartimaeus? The Bible said he was the son of Timaeus. He sat by the wayside begging. He was a blind beggar. All he could eat was the dust of the feet of the people who walked by him. But he heard that Jesus was coming in and said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they said, leave the master alone. He's got things to do today. What do you mean things to do? What did he come for but to seek and save that which is lost? Get your program out of the way and present Christ to them. Amen. Hallelujah. We don't need the program. We need God. And so they screamed at Bartimaeus and said, leave him alone. Bartimaeus screamed right back at him and said, shut up. I'm not going to shut up. I will not be quiet. And he cried out to him, and the Lord said, Salvation has come, healed him. And he could see from that day on, God blessed Bartimaeus. But there's another story in Jericho, and that's Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was one of those bill collectors. He enriched himself from other people. He had a reputation, everybody knew him. And he saw Christ, and he was a little man, a little fellow. Don't know how tall he was, but he's a little fellow. And he, in order for him to see, he climbed up in a sycamore tree. And there he was in that sycamore tree, and here came the master. Now, I know the good Lord knew where Zacchaeus was going to be. How many believe that? Why, sure he did. And here's Zacchaeus up there, and he's watching. He's looking. He's interested. He's curious. Now, how far, how deep his curiosity went, I don't know. You know, you can read a lot of things into the text, but we know for certain he wanted to see him. So he climbed up in the tree, and the Lord Jesus comes. And here we have them on either side shouting. And blind Bartimaeus is glorifying God. And the disciples are scratching their head trying to figure out, well, how do we handle this religious event? Just shut up and get out of the way. That's how to handle it. Just let Christ take over. Let Him do the job. And when he got close to Zacchaeus, he looked up into that tree and said, Zacchaeus, come down! Salvation has come to thy house this day. Man, they say the sycamore tree doesn't have any bark on it because he burned it coming down. That may be so. Who knows? I don't know. I don't know if that sycamore tree is like our sycamore. I don't know. But I know this. He came down. And boy, when he came down, he started confessing. He did. If I've taken anything from any man wrongly, I'll replace it. I'll do this. I'll do that. I'll do this. Why? He had Christ. That's why. Christ first and all the rest of that stuff. Man is in a rebellious state with God. Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 7 says this. 
Romans 8. It's good to be here this morning, isn't it? How many of you felt that spirit in here this morning earlier? I did, and I prayed against it right over here. I bound it in the name of Jesus and pled the blood on that spirit, and now it's lifted. Folks, remember, you're in a spiritual battle when you come in here. You're naive to think that you're going to come in here and have the kind of services we have, and the devil not show up and try to mess it up. But come against him in the name of Jesus. Romans 8 and verse number 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Now this word enmity, Romans 8, 7, is from the Greek word ekthra, ekthra, epsilon, key, theta, rho, alpha, ekthra. What does that word mean? Hate. The unsaved mind hates God. Man is a rebel in rebellion against the Lord. Amen. Have you agree with that? I lived for 27 years a rebel against God. Man, nobody could tell me anything. By the time I was three, I knew it all. (laughs) When I was four years old, I walked out of the house with my little one-year-old brother, my mother lying drunk on the sofa. I took him by the hand. He's crying for something to eat. When I was four, I walked out the front door. Left her lying on the sofa and took my little brother to my grandfather's house. And I remember him coming to the door and I looked up at him like that. And my grandfather was dumbfounded. There stood his two little grandsons and he brought us in and he gave us something to eat. That's the kind of person I've been all my life. I don't buy anything from anybody on face value. I've always been a skeptic. And he has answered every prayer and every need and every doubt that I've ever had. The Lord Jesus Christ has satisfied my soul to my bone. The Lord Jesus Christ is everything that I have ever wanted, ever needed, ever looked to. He is the salvation of my soul. I love him with all of my heart and all of my soul and all of my spirit. He's everything. It's all about him. Now, that's the kind of person I am. If you try to shove something down my throat and make me believe it, you you might as well deal with a stone wall. Lay it out there in front of me and say, now go read this and take some time and pray over it and think about it and meditate. I'll be glad to. But don't try to ram it down my throat. I won't accept it. I'll reject it. And do you know something? I love the Lord Jesus Christ. I've taken Him into my heart because He's as real as real gets. Here are the simple steps to salvation, and I'll close with these. These are simple steps to salvation. Simple. You may not understand they're happening. You may not be able to identify them when they happen. But here's what happens to you when God saves you. Psalm 34, verse 18. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear Him, upon them that hope in His mercy. Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Have you ever been in a place where you knew you needed God? That's step one. Do you know how that happened? God did that for you. He did it for you. When you awaken it's awakening. It's just, you remember that movie they made a few years back called The Awakening? They gave them dopa, el dopa, some kind of a thing. All these people, they, they just sat like this. And if you tossed them a ball, they'd reach out and grab it. But they couldn't act on their own. They could only react. And they were just like zombies. They sat there whole day. They were smart people, but they sat there all day. There was a deficiency of something. But they gave them dopa, el dopa they called it. They started injecting them with that first thing you know. They came out of that. They were walking around talking to each other. They they were essentially living normal lives. And it was a miracle. But for what some reason, I don't remember the the storyline, but for some reason, they went back into that condition that they were in. And the movie ends where they're just frozen. That's the condition of an unsaved man. When it comes to spiritual things from God, you're as foreign to them as they can be. You have no desire for anything spiritual. None. This is what he's talking about. Have you ever felt that? (coughs) 
Have you ever felt your need for God? That's God that did that for you. I have, preacher, but I didn't get any further with it. You can this morning. You felt that need? Then in John chapter number 16, verse 8. You don't have to know these scriptures. You don't have to need to know them in the Bible. You don't have to know the books of the Bible. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to be saved. You don't have to have a pile of books on systematic theology and all that stuff. You don't have to, you don't have to understand any of that. But look at John 16, verse 8. When He has come, Holy Spirit, He will reprove the world of sin. What sin? Verse 9. Because they believe not on Me. The work of the Holy Ghost, therefore, is to turn the lights on. Then point you to Christ. Say, believe on Him. You need to believe on Him. You need to believe on Christ to get a little deeper into the text of righteousness because He goes to His Father. What's that mean? That means the Lord Jesus Christ ascended to heaven, Romans 10, by His own righteousness. He's saying to you, compare your life and your righteousness with the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're going to come up far short. That condemns you. That convicts you. That's what that means. Say, not in thine heart who can ascend above, Romans 10. Christ ascended, folks, the only one who ever did it. He ascended to the right hand of the Father by His righteousness. Nobody pulled Him up. He went up on His own. He had to because the earth couldn't hold Him by His own righteousness. And then notice Romans chapter number 5. And I'll offer this to any of you today. Romans chapter number 5. And this is beautiful. Romans 5, verse 15. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God, the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded to many, not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment by one to condemnation, the free gift is of many offense justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men to justification. Over and over and over again, salvation is the free gift of God. No strings attached. What if I don't understand? Don't have to understand it. You're not receiving something you understand. You're receiving a person. 1 John chapter number 5 and verse number 12. He that hath the Son, not he that hath the Baptist church or the catechism, but he that hath the Son hath life. How do you know you've got the Son? Do you love Him? Has your life changed? Do you desire spiritual things? Do you sense a cleansing, separating work taking place in you? When you first got saved, you went to places that you'd not dare go to now. Five years, ten years down the road, that's called sanctification. Young converts in Christ sometimes takes them a while to begin to understand spiritual realities and spiritual battles that are going on. And for a while, they may do things that later on they say, hold on. Wait just a minute. God uh, allowed my ignorance, but no longer. That's sanctification. Finally, do you long for His appearing? Do you really? Do you long for His appearing? I can't explain it to you if you've never been born again. There's no way for you to understand it. There's nothing you have to understand it with. You, cannot, you can't conceive the change that takes place. David Berkowitz is a cold-blooded, demon-possessed, Satan-worshipping killer. What changed him? They didn't promise him that he'd turn him loose. They didn't say, oh, you, you become a Christian, we'll let you out of prison. No. No, 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 no. Carla Faye Tucker took a pickaxe, took it up, and buried it in the chest of her victim. That's pretty rough stuff. 
And yet she went to her death with a smile on her face. How'd that happen, preacher? The same way it happens for any of us. God can spare you a lot of trouble and heartache if you'd come to him this morning. Just as you are, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. Not easy believism and not some long list of stuff that you have to be willing to do to be saved. Just come and accept the free gift of God, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you do it? Father, in thy name we pray. I've delivered my soul. I preach what you put on it, Lord. I cannot do any more, and you don't want us to do any more. It's not our place to do anything. It's our place to be faithful ministers of the Word. As you said in Luke 16, they have Moses and the prophets. If they don't believe Moses and the prophets, neither will they believe the one come back from the dead. They have heard Moses and the prophets this morning. I pray that they'll receive that. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand up this morning.